Hello and welcome to Barn Blog. And today, Erica Whelan returns, and we're going to be talking about labor. And we're in a time where we've seen both an increase in labor action, but it's also been kind of vastly overstated. Um, why do you think that is? Why is there both? Uh, I mean, I think the railroad situation is like a, a prime example of this, but. Why do you think there's been this seizure of the Democrats about this renewal of labor, even though we lost a lot of uh, unionization actually went down significantly during COVID um, or union membership in already existing unions? Um, why do you think the Democrats have seen the need to like both kind of talk out of both ends of their mouth on this? Um. Well, uh, the Democrats do rely heavily on the AFL-CIO for fundraising. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of their major um, non-corporate backers. Um, and I think that they want to, I think that's part of it is they want to, um, they have to project the image of being friendly to labor um, in order to maintain the the sort of rank and file consent within um, the unions. Um, because keep in mind, a lot of rank and file union members, um, to the extent that they get political tend to support Democrats, because the Democrats appear to be the ones who are most friendly to labor. Um, they are generally the ones who um, are willing to um, promote labor's interests um, to a obviously very limited extent um, within, you know, decision making. Um, <laughs> the they are they have historically um, in the twentieth century been the party that has most um, this has passed the most legislation that um, allows unions to operate. Mm -hmm. Um, and so uh, there's this, uh, sort of association people have between Democrats and unions. Um, but the Democrats obviously are a party of capital so that the, there's a very limited scope with which they are, they are able to operate and, um, they have competing demand. So they want the, what they want to do is they want to make it look like and sound like they're supporting labor while not really meaningfully doing anything to promote labor's interests. And so essentially what they want to do is they want to sort of keep the existing unions, the AFL-CIO particularly, uh, in the fold and keep those union dollars coming and keep the union bureaucrats on their side and uh, maintain the uh, the acquiescence of the rank and file to the bureaucratic system that have that they've established that um, allows them to maintain that control. Hmm. So it seems to be though that that this becomes really kind of a point of contention with the Democrats, and always kind of has been as. Uh, public sector unionization tends to be where they're, where unions have not been totally decimated. And thus, they have to, on one hand, promote labor, seem like they're on the good side of the AFL-CIO. And on the other hand, it is often in their interest to suppress labor action with teachers, with railroad workers, with uh, municipal bus drivers, etc. So, um and this this is a bind that's been around for a while. I mean, it really you really started seeing it in the wildcat strikes, you know, um, with uh, with the postal workers in the '70s, which started under Nixon but kind of continued for a while. Um, There's a reason going postal became a <laughs> a thing that people talked about. Yes. Um. It's uh. It seems like the Democrats were able to narrowly avoid a major action with the railroad unions, um, but that's not really totally settled yet, is it? 
No. Um, so the thing is that the railroad unions are governed under a different uh, um, bargaining uh, system than uh, from most other unions. So basically, uh, most people are familiar with the national, to the extent that they're familiar with the way labor law works, will be familiar with the National Labor Relations Act and the National Labor Relations Board, which is the process that the unions, uh, like teachers, uh, like the Starbucks workers and the Amazon workers have been dealing with. That's a much less restrictive um, um, uh, modality than what the Railway Labor Act imposes. Um, so for one thing, the Railway Labor Act uh, explicitly distinguishes between two types of disputes, major disputes and minor disputes. Whereas in most places, you can conceivably take action over if, if the boss decides to interpret a clause in the contract the way you don't like, you can take action and get the bosses to change their mind. On the Railway Labor Act, you can't do that. That's, a, that's considered a minor dispute. Now, if it comes to actually bargaining over the terms of the contract, that's a major dispute. But um, you have all sorts of roadblocks. Um, you have to give 30 days advance notice. You have to, there's um, arbitration. Um, we saw that the talks broke down and so they uh, convened a presidential emergency board, which made minor um, uh uh, actually, no, I didn't even make any um, like changes to basically told the, the, the workers to get fucked. You don't contribute to profits. So you can have a wage increase, but that's it. Um, mm -hmm. If they're if, obviously if labor doesn't contribute to profit, then why are they so desperate to keep people working? Um, but uh, so then that every time there's a bargaining process there's essentially a 30-day cooling that cool down period imposed under the rla and then everybody has to vote on it now this latest proposal um the there was a a, a um last minute negotiations between the white house and um the unions and the railroads and bear in mind this is basically just the class one railroads, which are the big long distance freight haulers. Mm -hmm. um, the class twos are, are not really affected. Um, this is all between like Union Pacific, Canadian National, uh, BNSF, <coughs> CSX, um, and the, you know, the big, big major freight hauler union, uh, railroads. Um, there are, are a number of railroads that just operate like short distance routes between, you know, there's a lot of railroads that basically just got established to um, move goods from a plant to a major yard or some other facility where it would go get put on a truck or something. Mm -hmm. um, but those, those are, not really affected because they're not the the ones who have been really like um, uh, riding their workers to the extent that the, the class ones have. So this latest round of negotiations imposed another period where the membership has to look at the proposal and then vote on it. Okay. Now, there is an ace in the hole, which um, so far have they 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 tried but bernie blocked it which is congress can pass a special act to force the workers back to work and this is this is only this only happens in the railway labor act this is also something that's not featured in the nlra hmm. so railroad i mean and let's talk about what they what the contention was because you know, some of it's just basic things that most workers get, even in the private sector, like paid sick leave. Sure. Um, so um, the class ones, BNSF is particularly bad about this. But um, technically, railroad employees are entitled to 30 days of paid sick leave a year. 
or they're they're entitled to 30 sick days um that's i i don't think that's necessarily paid um mm -hmm. i i i don't remember all the details of the the contract um i didn't really i didn't get a chance to look into it that deeply um, but that was one of the contentions was having available paid sick days. Now, the problem is that the railroads are basically saying, OK, yeah, you can take these days off, but you have to tell us well in advance before we're otherwise we're going to count it as a violation of our attendance policy. Mm -hmm. um, so if you get sick and can't come to work. You can take your paid day off, but that counts as an unauthorized, uh, unexcused absence. Ah, yes. Now, I've wor I've worked at corporations that had this policy where you had actually a very gener generous paid sick leave policy, but you actually could not ever access it because they could they would immediately punish you for it for reliability and and this mm -hmm. out of the other, um, which uh, which was a, a way of like seeming like they gave you benefits, but really not. Um, so that, that makes sense. Okay. So that's, and that's, that's what's actually at stake here. Okay. That's been a huge point of contention because people have missed significant life events, um, because they haven't been able to, I mean, there, there, there was a, a story about how one guy missed his wife in the hospital. Um, cause, uh, he was, he so the way it works is the, the, the other thing is like, you don't have like a regular set schedule, right? You're, you're on call. Now you're supposed to get one day off at one day off in seven. But what that means is at the end of your six consecutive days of work, they park you in a hotel somewhere for the day. And then you're we're just waiting to get called back for whatever shift they want you to work the next day. You work, you can work any, they can, they'll call you for any shift. Um, and you are on call. You must come in when they call you. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the, the because the, one of the things that they've been doing um, over the past couple of decades is they've been um, increasing the length of trains because they've had this whole precision scheduling thing, quote unquote, precision scheduling. Um, to where they'll try to like move everything going to certain points along a line at once um, and try to use as few trains as possible to move as many goods as possible. So what will happen is you'll get called in and then you'll spend, you know, hours sitting around waiting on all of the cars that are supposed to keep make up your, your, your consist a, a train when assembled, like all of the various cars and, and other components that make up the train is called a con consist. So you'll be waiting for all of the cars that to make up that are supposed to make up your consist to come in and then you'll go out. So that can take hours because you're waiting on other trains to come in. Mm -hmm. Then they have to move all the, everything around in your yard and get you set up and then you can go. Mm -hmm. Um. And then, uh, and while you're in the cab, you can't have any distractions. You are supposed to be focused on your controls and the train, you know, the train controls at all times. And uh, so that means no cell phones, no electronic devices of any kind. You can't even have a magazine in there to read. And they've got, can't, and they'll, they surveil you. And if they catch you, you know, doing something while the but the trains have a kind of autopilot so the tr like there's a it the it's not really an autopilot but basically what it is is it's a a um an auto throttle mm. and it's a dead man switch so as long as you are keeping essentially your I don't know exactly how it works, but they've got a sensor that it's basically, it's a, it's a pressure sensor. As long as you've got your foot on the pedal, so to speak, like it'll maintain its constant speed. And the only time it's going to stop is if you take off, if you, is if you remove your, you know, like whatever it is that, that you're doing that indicates that you're at the controls, 
if you stop that, it'll stop. But you know, it's on a, it's on literally on rails. The train is not going to drift any significant distance while it's driving. So conceivably, you know, if you're on a stretch of track where you know that there's not really going to be anything for quite a while, you know, that you could conceivably get away with uh, doing something like reading the magazine. In theory, it, this this could be safe for you to be able to operate the train. That's not mm-hmm. allowed. The other one, another thing that's right now that they're running with two per, two man crews. So you have to take turns um, and you have to stop the train, switch stations, and then start back up again. Hmm. Um, if you want to switch off. So basically you're sitting there doing nothing but staring at your controls for hours on end. I mean, that sounds awful. It, I mean, it's boring as shit. I can only imagine how boring that has to be just sitting there doing nothing for hours and just staring at shit. And, you know, I, these, these trains are not supposed to, not, things are not supposed to happen. Like it's just supposed to work. If -hmm. things are happening, then there's something going wrong. It's not like, you know, the 19th century where you had to constantly um, stoke it and, you know, like keep, keep, pay attention to the boiler pressure and everything. Like there's no, there's very little in the way of actual human intervention required on most modern trains. So are these regulations like things that are set up for, for a much earlier time period and just have been left for bureaucratic no reasons or what's going on there? No, um, it's all about, um, well, no, because what's ha- what's happening is um, it's about safety. In theory, like the ostensible like reason for all of these regulations is safety mm-hmm. because um, trains constantly derail. The crews are always getting blamed for it because they're fatigued, because they're sitting doing nothing for hours. And they don't really have a ch- an opportunity to break to, to take breaks because they're under pressure to get it from point A to point B. You know, it's it's similar to way the truck, you know, tr- long long haul truckers. You're under pressure to get from point A to point B in as short a time as possible, um, but um, you're constantly being thwarted by various factors um but you know unlike unlike on long haul trucker you're not on you're not on the open road you're literally on a set of rails and you're not really going to go anywhere any you know like if something happens to those rails it's going to cause you to go off then uh, Mm -hmm. you have a bigger problem um so people make there there's you know not a history of um train crews making mistakes because they're tired or they're bored. Um, And uh, add to that the fact that the railroads do not maintain their infrastructure very well. um, And they're running longer, heavier trains on rails that are uh, getting in, in, in increasingly worse shape because the most of the, Basically, all of the class ones are owned by big um, financial companies like Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway owns BNSF. And they are because these companies do finance, their whole thing is we're going to try to extract as much money out of this enterprise as possible Mm -hmm. in as short a time as possible. Because we want, you know, it's all about rate of return. Right. And so they don't invest in, they, they do minimal investment in, um, in infrastructure. And uh, they try to, you know, they run huge, long, heavy trains, which the ra- even in good condition, the railroad beds are not really designed to handle. Because the thing you have to remember is that, you um, Railroad beds are basically a a railroad, a railway is a set of metal rails 
that's been secured to um, wooden or concrete ties, mostly wooden because it's cheap, um, that are that are floating on a bed of um, uh, I forgot the term for it, but rock, basically, like loose rock. Um, so if as the as the train goes over, it's the weight of the train is pressing down on the rails. And as the train passes, the rails are coming up and down. So this causes vibrations and the uh, ballast. There we go. That's the that's the term. Um, the ballast is only, you know, the, the way that everything is designed is only really designed to handle a certain amount of weight. These can only deal with a certain amount of weight in a certain, in, in a certain, you know, a certain period of time before the vibrations get to the point where you're interfering with the ability of the train to operate properly. Right. So, I mean, this lack of investment in infrastructure from a highly privatized infrastructure is like something that's endemic to the United States. Um, and it is interesting because I, you know, I remember reading an article recently about even the most ambitious plans, uh, for railroad development in the U S are basically just getting us back to the railroads we had in the 1980s. Um, and at the same token, if the car, if the shipping lanes go down, like the economy can really, really freeze up. It's, you know, even weirdly even more than truckers I, I was not really aware until this uh you know until this labor action started happening how much was still going through the rails um i had sort of assumed given that the scale of the u.s trucking industry that most of it was had already had been outsourced to trucking but i was apparently wrong about that um, I mean, a, quite a lot of it has been outsourced to trucking, and I think um, I think part of it is that there's also been a move back to shipping mm. f uh, freight by rail away from trucks, particularly with the rise of energy prices. Mm -hmm. um, it's become less; ex it's become more economical to move large quantities of goods long distances via, via rail. Um, versus you know trucking when fuel was cheap trucks were very competitive because they were inexpensive to operate now that um safety standards for trucks have tightened up and fuel has gotten more expensive all of a sudden rail has become significantly more competitive mm -hmm. um and uh honestly trucks even even in the heyday of trucking most trucks still primarily um, were last mile. And that's really where the truck excels is the, the cargo comes into the rail yard and then you load it on a, onto a truck in, for it to bring it to its destination in the city. Um, for most, for most app, uh, uh, applications, that works really well. Um, and I think that's become increasingly true um, uh, since containerization, um, which is another important factor that a lot of people overlook, is the um, interim. So uh, there was this, you know, there there was a lot of investment under um, Bush two and Obama on intermodal, um, particularly Obama on like intermodal facilities. So where they were trying to make it. Um, facilitate the connection between um, like rail and trucks and um, ships and trucks or ships and rail. Hmm. And so, um, and the container played a, I mean, the container, the fact of having the container is what makes that possible. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that, that's an interesting problem. I mean, so I guess what we're seeing is an already stressed system being stressed to the limit by lack of labor and by a, a change in energy costs leading to rail being more utilized than it has been in the recent past. Um, but I also think it's interesting just how, how you know, 
capital is all about flows now. There's no a- accumulation of stock. So any part of the system of flows breaking down right now sends shockwaves through everything. Like, um, and I guess that's been true for a long time. But it's it, you know when I started looking at food recently, I've, I've noticed that it's gotten much more intense in the last ten years. Um, so. Where does that? Where, where do you see the, the the situation going from here? Um, from what I'm, I'm given to understand, um, most of the um, railroad unions, the rank and file, do not want the contracts that have been proposed because um, they have the the last minute deal that the that the, the administration worked out um does provide for a couple of like i think it does provide for a couple of like unscheduled um paid sick days to where like you aren't Mm -hmm. gonna they can't ding you anymore for even you know just for taking one unscheduled day off but um Mm -hmm. it's only gonna be a it's only gonna be a few and then um Benefit contributions from employees will now be capped, whereas before there was a cap, there was no cap. So essentially what the railroads were looking to do was unload more of the burden of maintaining their um, their benefits packages onto the workers. Um, mm-hmm. It does nothing to address precision, precision scheduling, which is a major point of contention for particularly the um locomotive crews mm-hmm. um because you know like i said you're you're on call basically 365 days a year and their idea of a day off is they stick you in a hotel somewhere 80 miles from home for the day and then you're you don't get any rest because you know that you're going to get called back for another shift the next day you know basically you're just sitting there worried to trying to figure you know idling doing nothing and waiting for them to call you back Mm -hmm. Mm. um and the there's a lot of other issues as well um those are the probably the biggest ones but just in general um the you know they want more money uh they want better benefits they want more flexibility in their scheduling um they also want to i think want to be treated better um i there's a lot of um you know a railroads the management is always trying to you know what they they, oh uh, they want they're trying to stop one man crews is a big thing um it's one of the big things that they're after Mm -hmm. um there's also uh a lot of discussion with the rank and file, within the rank and file about trying to reduce the size of trains because these big heavy trains are derailing like i said about the you know the infrastructure of the rails like they're just not designed to handle these big heavy long trains so ultimately you keep running them and and you're going to work the track or you know move something out of position and then um you're gonna you're gonna derail they're they want to they want better conditions within the cab as well to where they're able to relax and not have to um you know maintain the the train you know keep their thing running the whole time um because just you know sitting there paying you can't Human beings are not capable of maintaining 100% alertness and focus for long stretches of time. We're just, we just can't do that. And that's essentially what's demanded of, of train crews, of the, the engineers on the freight trains. Um, they, want the, in, they want the railroads to invest more in the infrastructure and maintain it so that the, the trains stop derailing. Um, because, you know, they don't, it, 
trains derail a lot more often than people really think because mm -hmm. it just doesn't get reported on. You get these, you get some, you know, a few here and there get reported on. Like there was that big one in uh, Lac Megantique a few years ago. Um, and there are a few, you know, big oil trains. And it, it, by the way, it's mostly the oil trains that were derailing mm -hmm. back when the shale oil boom was happening. And the um, so the particularly and, dangerous ones to derail too. Exactly. Yeah. And it's the ones. It, it, so, the, so what it has the, the other the other thing is I that which reminds me is it's it's trains hauling large cargoes of liquids particularly because whether it's oil or other you know chemicals because what what happens is. The vibr in a di so I mentioned about how like your your the the rails you create these vibrations. Well, the thing is, you start sloshing these liquids around, mm -hmm. and if you set up enough, if you set up again enough wave in there, it's eventually gonna, you know, the mass of the liquid is eventually gonna disrupt the center of gravity of the car, and all of these cars are linked. So one, if all it takes is one car to go just a little bit too far and, you know, go over its, you know, move its center of gravity to the point where it can't recover. And that whole train is stopping and you're going to lose a bunch of cars. They're going to come off. You won't necessarily lose the entire train, but you're going to lose a bunch and you're going to spill a bunch of stuff that you really don't want getting spilled. And in a lot of cases, these uh, spills end up happening near residential areas. Mm, that's a problem. So, so we have conditions of labor. We also have conditions of infrastructure. And one of the things I've been tracing is across the, the board, there has been infrastructure decay because there's not a lot of, frankly, there's not many areas in which it's profitable right now to reinvest in infrastructure. And ironically, the longer you let it go, the more expensive it is to do, the harder it is to fix, and it, it, it becomes a, a pretty nasty compounding feedback loop. And we see this in both the private and the public sectors in the United States. Um, but this, to me, this does not bode well for the future of a lot of, you know, uh, labor when you're also considering that the Fed is more or less declaring open war on uh on on semi-skilled labor that's gonna be an interesting problem um because a lot of these places know they need more workers they they don't have enough um they're also trying to make sure that the workers don't get too much power in this time where by market rights they should uh and you also have the fed trying to create a uh a cost of debt environment that will eventually cause layoffs. Now, I don't know how much the Fed will have to send, send us into a recession for that to happen at this point. I mean, that's actually going to be really hard to do without just totally tanking the world's economy. But um, that doesn't put labor in a great situation, even though you would think, you know, by, by everything I was taught in classical econ class, this should be a good time for labor. You know, particularly in, in these high these high important areas like logistics, they can shut everything down. But the problem is that the American working class is very disorganized. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't just mean I, I mean that in, in, two, in, in two ways. One, obviously, is the fact that the union density in the United States is very low. The United the American working class has been. um Labor has historically never been as strong in the United States as it has in Europe, um, mm. owing to the fact that um, the United States had a significant and still to an extent has a huge escape valve, namely land. Mm -hmm. um, workers could get out of be, being wage laborers by, um, you know, 
going off and getting land and farming for a living. Um, it's, it's much, much, much less um, now than it used to be. And, and I think to the point where now it's basically that's, you can't anymore, but that's only been within the past half century, maybe, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that really became the case. Like, um, and you know, the, the consolidation of agriculture, family farms has thrown a lot more people into the job market. So we are immature, um, so to speak. Um, we do not have the, the same, um, conditions that have required us to come together and uh, act in concert with one another against our our bosses. We've also been, um, I mean, this is true. The, the American unions have also historically been very conservative. Um, while it's true that there have been, historically have been rather conservative unions in Europe, um, there's also a very strong tradition of radical unionism in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, the the um, socialists and communists, for all of the faults of the um, the you know the first and second internationals, um, placed a great emphasis on uh, working with and organizing workers. Um, and uh, they in they education of workers was incredibly important. And one of those was teaching people the doctrines of the international. Um, and you also have the anarchists um, who, you know, also historically tended to uh, be very um, involved in labor agitation and organization. In the United States, um, we have basically, and, and, and there's, there's some differences in the way labor representation works in the United States as well, um, that I think has caused some differences, uh, mm -hmm. in the U S basically, you, you basically will see one union in any given shop. I mean, it's, you, you'll, you'll see some, you know, some from big companies might have a few different unions representing different kinds of types of workers. The railroads are per particularly an example of this, but in um, uh, Europe, uh, particularly you know, in, on the continent, um, you'll see multiple unions in the same workplace. Um, they're all competing for members, um, but ultimately, it also has to do with the fact that there's uh, the the unions themselves um, are very divided. Uh, the AFL-CIO is, is heavily federated, um, and even though there has been a significant amount of consolidation within railroad unions over the course of their existence, um, they still maintain a significant amount of independence, and they particularly still uh, maintain, very much maintain a, a kind of craft identity, even where they've sort of amalgamated into larger unions. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so for example, um, like there was the big four, which is the brotherhood of locomotive engineers, um, the order of railway conductors, the brotherhood of locomotive firemen and engine men, and the brotherhood of, uh, railroad train men. The last three of those, um, joined with the switchman's union and in 1969 to find the United Transport Union and UTU would eventually merged with the sheet metal workers in 2014. But the locomotive engineers, the conductors, the firemen and engine men, um, they all, or, and the, or I'm sorry, the train men. So the train men were basically like everybody who all of the various like um, employee, it, uh, uh, ancillary employees that worked for the railroad, um, who weren't either like running the train, who basically weren't running the train, like the, the cab crew or their conductors. Um, so, but they all sort of like, a lot of them still maintain a kind of, um, 
sort of independent craft identity. You also have the the locomotive engineers and the um, uh, several other unions sort of combined to form the Transportation Communications Union, which is part of the Teamsters, um, including, by the way, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Um, and, um, but, you know, they're part of the Teamsters, but still they maintain a, a kind of independent, they still maintain independence within the Teamsters. They're not, nego they're not like, all negotiating with the united front um mm -hmm. they all strike their own individual deals with the with the, the employers um of course the railway labor act uh, encourages uniformity in and you know encourages a lot of uniformity in all of this um because and and they're only they're all working for the same employer but um, it reduces the effectiveness of action if, um, you know, some part of the railroad is able to operate. And I mean, we learned that this is this was one of the key lessons of the American Railroad Railway Union um, in the 1890s. Um, you know, with the, the the union that Debs put together. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was that the ARU was competing with the AFL, which most of the unions I just listed were part of. And of course the AFL was incredibly conservative. Right. It was, it was, it was strictly craft. Mo a lot of the unions that made up the AFL were, were as much fraternal societies as they were labor unions. They were almost yellow card guilds really. Yeah, I mean, they were they were mutual benefit societies as much as they were, like you know, fraternal benefit societies as they, as much as they were actual like labor unions. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, a lot of them just decided that they didn't want to go on strike. Most of them actually didn't really favor the idea of striking. They thought that the interests of labor and capital were more aligned than they were opposed and they felt like strikes were ungentlemanly they can they could reach deals by just negotiating with the bosses so um now I, obviously they didn't learn from the 1877 strike when they got i mean i guess they did learn but they learned the wrong lessons um from the 1877 strike which was put down by force mm -hmm. um but there was, you know, um, the the essentially my point is that you know these the the they prefer to maintain their independent interests and um, negotiate in the particular interests of their um, their workers rather than um, coordinating with the other unions and. Mm -hmm. Uh, insisting that you know you deal with all of us or you don't deal with any of us. Mm. If they if they want to like if they're going to maintain these independent unions, then that's what they need to do. Um, I think it would be better if they were to um, actually you know more formally merge and negotiate as a single block uh united under a single common organization but i recognize i also recognize that that's going to take a lot of work and is unlikely to happen in time in the near future right i mean it also seems like that might even get like federal pushback oh i absolutely would um and that's and, and here again we sort of circle back to the initial question which is the democrats do not want a truly powerful labor movement mm. they want to they want to they want to provide a few minor concessions here and there just enough that um just enough to to to, um, to keep the voting base loyal to keep That's... the voting base loyal and to and to to bleed off enough pressure so that they don't you know they don't pop the lid but they're not actually going to um deal with the fact that we're in this pressure cooker and, you know, let us out because the Democrats are benefiting from it. 
mo- you know, the, the the Democrats are are <laughs> the Democrats are just as just as invested in the system as the Republicans are. Right. I mean, absolutely, but it's it seems. It seems, you know, I've been looking at the AFL-CAO's like growth plan for a million in 10 years and or like what's it like 1% a year growth, um, which, as I pointed out, I, is slightly better than replacement, maybe. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the, the growth ambitions of the AFL-CAO, even at their most ambitious right now, are still very meager. Um, and the other thing I've noticed is that like these new unions, and I, and I don't say this because I do think it, I've said this a lot that I do think it's important to see the Starbucks unionization and uh, uh, Amazon shops, you know, form a new union, particularly the Amazon United. And it's a actual new union. That's good. But the, The general trend on those is we don't really know how much power those unions are going to really have. I mean, um, one thing we can say from 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 uh, history is like unions and highly broken up shops, franchises, or even a corporate owned shop like Starbucks, um, but that has like you have to negotiate the contracts at each at each individual labor site. Um, they don't have a lot of power historically. <laughs> um, it's better than nothing. And so we shouldn't like, but like, for example, this railroad stuff is serious um, in a way. I think maybe the Amazon stuff could also be serious, but only if it was to be over a significant number of shops. Right. Um, I think the, I mean, I don't think the Amazon, I don't think Amazon is, is nearly as serious mm-hmm. um largely because um i mean don't get me wrong amazon is big but it's not if amazon went down there are plenty of other players who can step into the breach right that's not true of the railroads themselves where if those stop nothing moves right I mean, and Amazon, yeah. Amazon needs railroads. Actually, I don't, you know, I don't know if Amazon, I, I don't know that Amazon ships anything by, by a railroad, but it, I would be astonished if they didn't. Or at least if their suppliers didn't, I yeah. mean, you know, at least the ones in the United States. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, that's, that's one thing that I've been really pushing people to look at in, in, in unionization is the, I, I I don't I don't want to say that these these small unions um, like Starbucks and Amazon aren't important, and I don't think you do either. No. But we do have to like point out that like. So one thing I'm noticing, for example, is teachers' unions have been mobilized for the past like six years, and after COVID, a lot of them. Now this is not true for all of them, and I don't want people coming on me say my union isn't like this particularly if you're in the industrial Midwest where the unions are still pretty active, but uh, we're just seeing people quit. Like they, they're, they're losing faith that the union's going to do much for them and they're just leaving the job. Um, uh, that may change if the fed has its way, you know, and, and wraps up unemployment. Um, but it, it's uh it's hard to see um where like a lot of key sectors and a lot of traditionally strong unions are still actually putting up a fight and the and the other thing i do think we have to deal with is the fact that the actually currently existing unions are not really growing it's 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 like new unions are growing um and i that, i don't think that's true in every field i think nursing's seen some some increase in unionization um but and we're not going to talk about nursing today because neither one of us fully prepared for it, honestly. There's a lot there. Um, but uh, it, it doesn't seem like it's going, you know, I was, I, I thought we'd see more action there than we have, honestly. Um, which is not to say we haven't seen action because we have. But, you know, 
I remember when we were hearing about Striketober a year ago and realizing that it was just a return to normal strike levels post COVID. That was all yes. it was. And, you know, and then I saw people like Doug Henwood, who, you know, somehow when I went to sleep and woke up and he became a Democrat. Um, but uh, really posting about like labor penetration being, you know, uh, and the great resignation being tied to like strong democratic states with strong democratic labor unions and then ignoring California in the statistics. And I was like, okay, you're just going to miss the biggest democratic state there is, you know, and not comment on the fact that, that, uh, that the trend actually isn't good there for resignation. Cause a lot of people left the state. Um, and and so I've seen a very selective tale told by the left to itself. And and it feels kind of like we're gaslighting ourselves. Like, you know, I know some of it's, you know, hope and change. And I know a lot of it is an, all this narrative that, like, Bernie revived the labor movement, even though I've been pointing out for years the labor movement, like, the labor uptick began in 2012. And it was very slow. You know, and Bernie did, I'm sure, played a role in it. That's not the same, but like the causal relationship that people have told themselves that, like, well, Bernie brought back the labor moment, look, Starbucks is just, it's fundamentally not true. And when you get to these key labor sectors, I mean, we do have Bernie to think for like stopping the worst, you know, thing the feds could do from happening, thing, you know. And so this is not me shitting on Bernie, but I, I think we've over attributed a lot of this to left electoral politics where what's actually going on is like no people are getting stretched to capacity and in a lot of cases COVID broke the capacity I don't know um, I'm not I mean, I'm, you know I'm not right. feeling strong good about labor anywhere in the world right now either so it's not just the United States well um, no labor is really not doing great in a lot of places, although I should note that um, all of the uh, base unions in Italy have agreed to join a general strike uh, in October, which oh, good. is a huge, um, like, huge, because um, that's been a, a major, um, like, issue with them is the various, uh, you know, the various base unions have kind of, like, not really been respecting each other's strikes. Mm. So, I, I, and not some, you know, like they won't basically, it's just they just won't join. Um, you know, one union will join us, we'll, we'll try to call a strike and then um, others won't join them. Um, mm -hmm. So, that's, that's, we do see some positive indicators here and there, but in general, things are looking kind of bad. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we have to look at the legacy of, um, the communist movement, um, the official CPs and assessing why that is. And the, you know, the, the, the various, uh, uh, turns that they took, um, you know, obviously the failure of the 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 Russian and German revolutions um, were what 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 you know sort of created the ground for that to happen. But um, you know, after the Stalinist counter revolution, they basically just like at every turn, they every opportunity they had, just fucked the working class over. Betra outright betrayed them um, and, you know, sent them to their deaths. I mean, I think, I think when you look at the official CPs, what we, what we've seen over and over and over again, I mean, one of the things I've just been flabbergasted with studying Latin America is that often the socialist parties and the social democratic parties are actually often outflanking the CPs to the left, um, which isn't saying much. Like, um, 
and 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 that was also the case in France, too. Um, and you know, one of the things that I, everyone likes to blame postmodernism for the decline of Marxism in France, and I'm like, I think it's the other way around. I think postmodernism is literally the result of the decline of Marxism in France because of the communist inability to deal with the Mitterrand government and because of the Mitterrand government's flirtation with neoliberalization that um, we started getting these these sort of like weird ideological bizarro spinning wheels um, that that when combined with France's like superstar, you know, Sabon culture led to this particular thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the I think it's weird to think that that caused the downfall of Marxism in, in like in uh, in in France. And in fact, you, you can explicitly tie it to like thinkers trying to deal with official CP policies um, in the 1950s and trying to justify this or that or move this or that away from this other policy. And, um, and I, I very much think in all these narratives, um, labor often isn't discussed by people studying the communist movement, which is kind of insane. Actually, you know, it's like we're not talking about the people that are supposed to be our subject. Like, I mean, you know, you're not even talking about the peasantry. I mean, I guess you're talking about students and professors like you're not, you know, and like uh -huh. what the official CP is doing to like pivot itself in in negotiating between Euro communism and Moscow. Um, and so but what I what I find interesting is that's not just true for Europe. That's also true for Latin America. Um And yeah, I'm with you. I, I, I think it's been it, it, it's been a disaster. Um, and we covered whether Nordic countries are probably where this has happened the least thoroughly. They too have, I mean, they, you know, when their unions were subsumed to the state, and which, um, and like Sweden, that actually opened them up to being participants in neoliberalization and in wage suppression, the unions themselves, which of course, in you know, decrease their popularity, and people are often not aware that that happened and that was part of the the rise of this right-wing movement in places like sweden now it's you know that's not as acute in places like uh denmark and and norway but you see similar trends and you see similar politics right um i think i think the i think we do have to realize that like labor in america's really got to do something much more drastic and much more pointed at places where it really hurts um, or it's going to be really vulnerable in the coming years as like the Federal Reserve isn't even pretending anymore not to be hostile to labor. I mean, I've been trying to point out to people that like the Fed used to explain um, how they're how uh, raising the interest rate worked by increasing savings. They don't explain that now. They literally think it's putting pressure on 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 labor. You know, making, you know, adding, you know, um, increasing nominal unemployment to what, what they, like 5%. I don't even know how they're going to do that, by the way, but still. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I obviously they are looking at the... Um, way that the you know protest movements have been co-opted and um uh rendered irrelevant um even you know the you know with the george floyd protests like look how quickly that got taken over and just completely neutralized right well i mean I can think one of the more popular things I've said is we've seen we've seen two BLM movements co-opted um, and the more mm -hmm. radical they are, the faster they were co-opted. Like, which I think I think I think that points to them not really actually being very radical. Right. They were they were. This is the pro. This is the problem that um, there is this really bad habit 
of examining of of just taking things at their appearances and just allowing the sort of performative aspects the 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 use of this you know radical language and the 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 posturing and the the mm -hmm. you know sort of like displays to be indicative of the real content of these movements and time and time again we see that the real content that the, the they do start off they uh, okay let me let me amend that they do start off quite radical the problem is that they then very quickly become de-radicalized and that the language and the language doesn't change. That, the I mean, like, language and the imagery gets co-opted, right? And that, but the actual movements, because they're not organized, because we don't have this level of organization, everybody just sort of joins together spontaneously, and then they don't know where to go because they don't have a plan because they haven't been, there's no foundation. There's no organization to keep this going forward in, a, in that direction. The, the, the forces that have the organization and the resources are precisely those that end up moving in, taking over and neutralizing these movements. Right. I mean, basically that you see, with BLM, we saw instant and often competing NGOification of groups, many of which have been involved in financial scandals. I mean, like, um, and that's not to, like to me. That's not a point against be like the idea of Black Lives Matter at all. But it shows you the shifts. I mean, it, there's also other shifts. Like I, I have pointed out to people, we have now seen two cycles in a decade where the concerns of Black Lives Matter move from stop killing us to abstract representation amongst middle class and upper middle class jobs. Like, we've now seen it twice in a decade under the same umbrella with the same name. It's not even like different movements. Um, the first we saw the movement from Black Lives Matter from Ferguson into campuses. And the last time we've now seen it Basically, from, you know, the George Floyd insurrectionary protest, whatever you want to call them, um, into, uh, into increasingly, like, HR statements. Um, and, you know, so much so that, you know, you know, people, like, like there has been increasingly people from the anti-Adolf Reed school talking about elite capture and it's it's kind of funny because they think they're arguing against what reed was saying and uh reed was actually that was his whole point is like no this will be instantly co-opted by a certain leadership class and a declining field of jobs um of an elite particularly where you know this is not based on production and i'm not getting into like non-productive workers aren't proletarian and that bullshit because it, it's that's that's a distraction but there is a real sense in which we've seen this happen over and over again. And what I find fascinating about it is labor has been involved both times and kind of sidelined both times. So the like, like um, municipal, but you know, busing, you know, bus unions and stuff, helping out during the float protest was actually of logistic importance. And, that has not been like paid back in any way. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, I think it's led to a kind of burnout and frankly, you know, you and I probably, I, I don't know if you agree with me on this. The only reason we're not seeing a major right wing backlash being successful is that the right has catered to, certain cultural notions that are profoundly unpopular and get people all up in arms immediately, rightly so. I mean, this is not me belittling that. And so you, what you see is like cultural overstretch immediately 
um, from the right. And that's the only reason the center left has not just like collapsed or liberals, whatever you want to call them, has not like collapsed under their weight of their their failure to do much of anything. I think the right is playing the same game with their Mm -hmm. they're playing the same game as the Democrats do with us um, with their people. Mm. You'd like to go into that just a little bit. That's be a last question for the day. Um, so essentially what I, what, what, what I'm saying is that they are doing the same, all of this performative nonsense, uh, outrage that they do with, you know, of course, they're actually a little bit more serious about pressing their policy agenda because they're willing to, um, they're more politically driven, whereas the Democrats are more economically driven. Mm Mm-hmm. Like the Democrats are essentially the party of the economy and the Republicans are the party of politics. But um, so essentially what they're doing is they're they are doing um, effectively the same thing with uh, the right, the the far right, as um, the Democrats are doing with the left. They are um, giving them just enough to make them um, accept the identification with the Republicans and keep them coming out to the polls and voting Republican and giving them money, but not enough to actually give them what they want. Mm -hmm. the, the, The Republicans recognize that they are that the Republicans recognize that there's a limit to how far they can go and still maintain and still maintain the status quo. Things are are very dangerous right now because of the economic crisis and the deepening crisis of confidence in the state. And so both sides have to play very carefully. They have to play their cards carefully. And the Republicans, the, the Roe v. Wade going away um, is part of a, a need on the part of the capitalist class to kick reproduction back into, into gear. Um, the, the issue is that, dec- you know, the birth rate has been declining historically and uh, particularly now with the COVID epidemic and the massive population hit that we've taken, um, labor is going to be in a much stronger bargaining position because of the relative shortage of labor. Do you really think they thought that out? Like I've heard this and I, I, I get, I get how this theory works and I've thought about it a long time. I don't, I don't know how clearly they have thought it out. I don't know that they've necessarily like theorized it out in this, in the way that I'm doing here. What I'm saying is I think these are the, the, the forces that are at play that are, that are pushing them along and their policy, their, their, their policy agendas. Well, I mean, I, I find it interesting because it also seems like the Republicans keep on telling the Republicans to shut the fuck up. Like, like, I mean, the, the amount of like Mitch McConnell being like Lindsey Graham, don't do this. Uh, uh, Rick Scott, we didn't actually mean for you to say that we're going to like neoliberalize all the, you know, the pensions right now. Um, this, that and the other. Um, it does seem like they've managed to shoot themselves in the foot, but it also seems like there's imperatives driving them to do it that aren't entirely clear and you know some of this is what some of this is uh you know a lot of the more horrid stuff that that happened in the trump administration has actually been maintained by the biden administration i mean particularly um you know not all of the immigration policies but a lot of them we have not gone back to uh pre-trump norms although i mean even pre-trump norms are kind of a exaggerated because obama was also a, a heavy de- 
Grabby deporter. Well, Obama fucking not to enable people like ASCOM was an Obama uh, it was an Obama as secure communities. Uh, to, was an to, Obama era policy, was right? It was an Obama era. It was like Obama pioneered that, and literally secure communities was fucking knocked with naval. Right. INS would show up in the middle of the night and deport people. Right. I mean, this is the crazy thing about. I still don't think people have dealt with. We always think of the Clintons for triangulation, and we we see that with you know the finish the final nails, you know in in the in the coffin of uh, welfare, but, and the movement of, of everybody who used to be on welfare on a disability. Um, but the other thing that you see is this triangulation continued under the Obama administration, you know, where you got DACA, but then you have like the, the actual intensification of the immigration regime, which led to Trump. I mean, like that, there is a consistent, and, and you know, this is something Trump has to point out, and Democrats are in dire need to try to disprove. But there's a consistency of policy here, which indicates that it's driven by, you know, a kind of consensus that no one really yet can break. Um, you know, and some of the things that are also interesting, for example, I've been talking about the Hadrian's walling of the American empire. So like drone strikes have significantly slowed under Biden. Um, we are, we are fighting a proxy war that's giving all the arms manufacturers money, but you'll notice that we're, there's a limit to how much we're willing to do directly. And I'm always pointing to historical examples of that. I'm like, if that's just like, I mean, this isn't even capitalist shit. Like this is shit you see in empires like, you know, um, Rome in the fourth century do this. <laughs> like, this is what empires do, you know, in, in the classical sense. They, once they hit their, their it, once they have to acknowledge they've hit the resource wall, they start doing proxy shit um, even more, but they pull back in a, in a real sense for their actual forces, right? And what I find interesting about this is, you know, this is something they think about a lot, is like, what part of our situation is capitalist unique? And what part of our situation is like these kinds of systems? Most of it is capitalist unique, but like some of it's not. And, you know, we're, we're kind of off tangent here, but I don't think what drives this is like, I don't think it's because Biden's a good guy, right? This is where like, like what I want to like get people to think about I, as much shit as he got for Afghanistan. Um, that was going to happen eventually anyway. Like, there's no way that 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 they would keep continue that forever. There have been negotiations since Obama was in power about what you like how how you would hand off to the Taliban knowingly and since they couldn't finish the deal it just happened to have hazardly but it was going to happen. And so, you know, this is why I'm not like big on getting bite. I don't want to you know, I don't want to pretend for example that as, as there are some really, really weird communist arguments that somehow that like Trump was an anti-imperialist and Biden's an imperialist when like Biden's actually de-escalated some policies. But I also, I don't think it's really because of like even a policy agenda change. It's like a realization of limits. Yes. That, you know, the, the empire is not as dumb as people think, unfortunately. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, that sort of leads me with a couple of um, mm -hmm. couple of thoughts to close with, which okay. is um, one: um, there is no, there will never be, so long as um, capital is the the prevailing mode of production, um, th there will never be an anti-imperialist candidate in uh, in in power, like. All capitalist states, if not already imperialist, are proto-imperialist. Yeah, they would love to be. <laughs> they want they're they're either imperialist or imperialist and waiting. Um, um, the uh, another thing is that um, um, what we have to understand. One of the most important things people need to understand is that. Um, while these are real flesh and blood people in these positions, they're also acting as character masks 
for forces that are outside their control. Right. There, there are social dynamics occurring that exist because of um, the way that because of the the relationships between people that capitalism has created and are making decisions under circumstances that were framed by decisions that were made years or even decades ago. Men make their own history, but they do not do as so as they please. Right. The weight of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. Which is a, which is a way to say that the style of this can change depending on the leader. But a lot of the actions, they might be administered differently, but they're going to pretty much turn out a certain way. The fundamental yeah. needs of the American state and, and uh, of capital have not changed. Mm. What changes is the methods that they use to satisfy those needs. Which I basically agree on. And so uh, this is my nice way of saying, uh, and, and I guess yours too, Erica, that um, social Democrats, you're going to have to, you know, be a lot stiffer um, to get anything you want, i.e. not be social Democrats anymore. Yes. And 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 I think the fundamental, like I was I was mentioning, the lack of organization, the lack of a um, a base. We need to get organized, and the way that we're going to be able to provide the resources that one of the biggest ways that we're going to be able to provide ourselves with the resources that we are that we need to be able to continue to to effectively um, engage in the struggle is by unionizing because not only will strong unions have money and other resources they can provide to working class organizations the fact of them struggling for higher wages and better working conditions means that workers themselves will have more resources and this isn't this is a why one of the reasons that engaging in uh, that organizing unions and engaging in struggle for um, at, at the point of production, not just to overthrow capital, which is necessary, but to build the level of organization to, to develop the skills and to acquire the resources that we're going to need to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And that's what unions are for. Right. Yeah, I agreed. I mean, th this is this is why I've not taken the classical counselist position against unions because I I, I think it 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 is it un, it ignores the need for capacity which unions build and we don't have another way at least at the current time to build it and no one's proposed any other way to build it either. So, uh, and I think that's that's the key point of why we should really follow this labor stuff and why we should even be you know. Well, we should look at labor built power probably more than reforms. I'm not, I mean, you and I might take slightly different views on reforms. Um, actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure we do, actually. but um, I'm the kind of depends the, on the what, what yeah, it, it to. really does too. Yeah, like, like I'm not one of these impo like people who would be like, well, don't argue for socialized medicine because it's gonna just save capital and i'm like well that's not why you argue for socialized medicine <laughs> right. like like uh labor is being alive is in and not in like debt peonage is usually a good thing like even if that is a capitalist vice um same with minimum wage you know i've, I've been involved with uh, earlier i was i was involved with marxists who oppose minimum wage altogether which i thought was crazy even though i don't think minimum wage a minimum wage that would actually be high enough to work will never happen because it wouldn't it would like collapse things honestly but yeah i mean <laughs> i don't so yeah I, that would that would i think that would get into a whole different, entirely different conversation debate right one that i think you and i are actually probably share opinions on but i i think would is beyond 
uh, the, the the purview of our talk today. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'd like to thank you for coming on, Erica, and we're going to try to get you back on in a couple months. Um, we'll t- hopefully, there'll be good labor news to talk about. Uh, but you know, I'm not I'm not crossing my fingers. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, we'll um, see. Yeah. There's a lot of incentive right now. There's a lot of pressure right now. I think one of the reasons that the 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 uh, administration decided to work out the deal um, it was to because the closer they can um, kick the can to down the road to the midterm elections, the more pressure there's going to be on the workers not to go on strike, lest by striking, they make Democrats look bad and invite people to vote Republican out of anger because um, all of a sudden they're not getting what they want. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, and you know, I, we can, we can, we can have a conversation about whether they're they're And I, you know, I'm not, not to say that they aren't justifiable in being upset with that. Not, not to say that they wouldn't be justified in, in being upset about not being able to get basic necessities of life. But, um, the you know the unfortunate fact is that it is um with the way that you know the 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 media being owned by the capitalist class and the low level of um class consciousness um amongst the working class right now um they're more likely to blame workers for it than they are capitalists even though ultimately the capitalists are the ones mostly you know mostly responsible for the fact of the um workers being in um the the condition that they are to where they want to go on strike like that Mm -hmm. and you know again i have to emphasize most of these unions are very conservative and generally and between their their innate conservatism and the um, obstacles that the RLA places in the face of labor action, the mere fact that the things have gotten to this point is in itself significant. It means that the un- that the workers in these unions are really pissed off and are and are like close to being ready to fight. And these are people who, have not struck have not have have historically been reluctant to engage in this kind of action right Agre- yeah agreed and that's an important point uh, if when you start seeing these more conservative unions um in these craft these craft adjacent unions do this it means things are getting really bad um uh well, thank you for coming on. And like I said, we'll see you again. Is there anything you'd like to uh, plug on your way out? I know we have to do the Rentier Shindig at the end. Um, I just invite people to follow the reports that the uh, party, the International Communist Party, does on labor activity. We try to keep track of what um, the working class is up to around the world. And uh, what's one of our main things is. Um, promoting this kind of activity and encouraging people to um to work together in the common struggle against our class enemy mm-hmm. well thank you for coming on and people should check that out and i will probably try to put that in the show notes um that's the international communist party correct correct www.international-communist-party.org all right thank you so much have a great day you too.